Bharat University, remained as the chairman of the Indian Council of Historical Research, which is ICHR, Government of India from 2007 to 2011. Sir was the Tagore National Fellow, Ministry of Culture, Government of India, from 2013 to 15, and he remained for a long time as a professor of history at JNU, Delhi. His had earlier research and teaching positions in St. Anthony's College in Oxford University and at a very important department, which is to me, which is the Department of History, the University of Chicago. Because many books that I've seen in archaeology, comparative archaeology, the first archaeology of Egypt, the first archaeological documentation of the Middle East, or say what Apala and Julie was talking about, uh, that is Phoenicia, the Hittites, the Mycenaeans, and the Achaeans, or the Dorians, or the Aeolians, where f including the city of Persepolis in Persia, they're all first documented by the University of Chicago people. You know, yeah, that's a very important university. Chicago always remaining important with the arrival of Swamiji in the City Beautiful movement, of which the Parliament of World Religions was a, was one of the extension dimension. But it was actually a movement, a change that was coming to the world where Nikola Tesla was trying to bring in the alternative current system and opposing Edison, where the city planners like Ebenezer Howard was trying to bring in a garden city plan, and where the whole idea of American governance, you know, the, the Columbia, the land of liberty, fraternity, and equality was getting a huge prominence. What we call GIS or GPS today, the Geographical Information System, was actually born in the University of Chicago. So Sir has an experience from the University of Chicago. So that's very, very important. I just wanted to share some of those thoughts. Some of his recent publications include Talking Back, the Idea of Civilization in the Indian Nationalist Discourse, the Defining Monuments in Bengal, on Gurudev Ravindranath Tagore, an interpretation which is by Penguin, the Mahatma and the Poet, Letters and Debates between Gandhi and Tagore. And just to mention of many, Buddha for the Young, which has been translated into eight Indian languages till now. That is really, really, really commendable. So let us give a warm hand to Professor Shobhushachi Bhattacharya, former Vice Chancellor, Bishop Bharati University, Shantiniketan, and currently with this esteemed Institute of Culture, sir. Friends, it is a very great pleasure to be here today with you on the occasion of this marvelous conference which has been put together by Joyce and Bhav Maharajji, our Lord Head of the uh, in logical department uh, and their teams uh, both at IIT and at this institution. Uh, I have half an hour so I will not uh, um, waste time on preliminaries and go straight into my subject and my subject is exactly what uh, was announced as the theme of the conference, which was the historical evolution of uh, India, especially the spiritual and cultural elements, uh, in the light of the thoughts of Swami Vivekananda, Sri Aurobindo, and other luminaries. However, for the present, my own ignorance uh, will uh, stop me from talking about Sri Aurobindo and others. Uh, for the last few years I have been working on an intellectual biography of Swami Vivekananda and therefore 
with your permission, I will limit myself to Swami Vivekananda's views. Now, no, no. Right. Now, Swami Vivekananda's uh, writings on this subject uh, are not too many. You know that he was like a meteor. In just 10 years, he changed the whole face of India and India's mind. And in those 10 years, he packed a lot of activity of which only a small part was writing. So most of his views on the historical evolution of India, especially cultural and spiritual India, we would try and elicit from his uh, lectures and to begin with we have the speeches at Chicago in 1893. Uh, now it, we don't often remember today that actually the uh, conference, the Parliament Religions in Chicago was on a very special occasion, it was part of the Colombian celebrations, the celebration of the discovery of America by Christopher Columbus. And as a part of the Colombian um, celebrations in, in, the, in North America, in the United States, Chicago held a special conference on Parliament of Religions. And Swami Vivekananda was very much aware of this background and in several speeches in Chicago he spoke of it and he said that this is a part of the history of the expansion of Europe, a part of the history of Europe's con conquest of the world, of colonization of Europe um, by Europe of the rest of the world. And thus some of his early thoughts on the relationship between the East and the West and two cultures, two civilizations and sets of nations. Go back to the Chicago the speeches of 1893. And then he, his lectures in the United States and in England and in part in France uh, in uh, the years 1893, 1890, um, five, six, seven, particularly 1893 uh, to five. And then his second visit when he went there, um, chiefly to the west of America, uh, in particular, I would uh, request you to recall his speech in Los Angeles in 1899, 6th of January, 1899, I'm sorry, in, in 1900, he gave a talk on exactly the theme of this conference, the historical evolution of India. It's a very important essay to which I'll come back. And then thirdly, we have a number of essays he wrote, which when he returned to India uh, from the United States, uh, and this was uh, the Udbodhana, uh, series of uh, art articles. In particular, I recall two, which we all know from, many of us would know from childhood. One is Bhattaman Bharat, the other is Pratsyo Bhaschattu. That is to say, contemporary India, and the other article is the East and the West. Uh, in these articles, he particularly addresses India's dilemma. Uh, dilemma of modernization, the Western impact, uh, and uh, thus again uh, India's culture and identity was the chief theme. Uh, in understanding Bhutananda's writings on this subject, I would say that it's important for us to recall that uh, he gave great uh, importance to uh, 
he will just, I think, I'll go back to his methodological approach. He gave great methodological importance to the means of acquiring knowledge. Uh, philosophically, this was very important because if you look closely at his epistemology, that is say his theory of knowledge, he underlines three sources. One is pratyaksha or perception, what you actually see, or through your indriyas or senses, uh, you um, uh, understand. Second is anumana or uh, inference, and the third is agama or um, aptavakya or the uh, uh, um, advice or knowledge of competent uh, authorities. And uh, in the appendage to the only large volume book that Swami Vivekananda wrote, Raja Yoga, there is, you may remember, a long um, set of uh, commentaries on Patanjali. And uh, there's a slog there which, uh, uh, slog number seven, where uh, the three sources of knowledge are given, Pratyaksha, Anumana, and Agama. Uh, these are the sources. And we can this translation was direct perception, uh, inference, and competent evidence are proofs. Now, what do we mean by competence? Not only is it remarkable that he does not claim that there is God-given knowledge. It is knowledge acquired by human beings. And second, by competent evidence, he means not anyone who comes along and claims that he has special knowledge, but he says aptyavakya is uh, to be examined for veracity. I'll read out one passage where this is from Bhagavan uh, this commentary on Shloka 7. He says that philosophers go into long discussion about Aptavakya and they say, what is the proof of their words? The proof is their direct perception. Please remember, the sages' direct perception, which again is knowledge, is empirical knowledge. Because whatever I see is proof and whatever you see is proof, if it does not contradict any past knowledge, there is knowledge beyond the senses and whenever it does not contradict reason, mind the word reason, and past human experience, that knowledge is proof. Any madman may come into this room and say he sees angels around him. That would not be proof. Um, Etc. I will not go further into this. But this epistemology, this uh, knowledge, this approach to the issue of knowledge is, I think, important. And we can this own reflections on India's present and the past. Well, I believe chiefly derived from his own perception, uh, his own inferences, and to the extent he relied upon Aptavakya. Uh, the important question here, what do we mean by spiritual? And what did Vyakaranda mean by that? This question was touched upon by Swami Bhajananda, Bhajananda yesterday, and Bhajananda Ji's words are memorable. He also cites Raja Yoga. And especially if you look at Vyakaranda's uh, um, lecture on Vedanta philosophy, 
uh, which is in volume one of the collected workshops. I've used the word CWSV uh, to refer to collected workshops from the Vivekananda, indicating volume and page number. Uh, now, Vivekananda makes a distinction between paths to knowledge. First, there is Indriya, which is the perceptual knowledge, then Manas and Buddhi, and finally there is Atman. And as Swami Bhajananda told us yesterday, it's an important distinction that is often made in India between mind and Atman. And spiritual evolution is the cultivation of knowledge of Atman, according to Swami. Uh, and it's important to also note that Vivekananda made no distinction between the methods of physical science and the methods of yoga. Uh, in uh, the work of Raja Yoga, uh, there is one passage which I would like very briefly to refer to. Uh, he says about yoga and knowledge of yoga, anything that is secret and mysterious in these systems of yoga should be at once rejected. Yoga fell into the hands of a few persons at one time. They made it a secret instead of letting the full blaze of daylight and reason fall upon it. They did so so that they might have the powers to themselves. In the first place, there is no mystery in what I teach. And second, I believe it is wrong to believe blindly. You must exercise your own reason and judgment. You must practice and see whether these things happen or not, that is say, the yoga practices. Just as you would take up any other science exactly in the same manner, you should take up the science this science for study. And these are very important words. Uh, so this was his approach to spiritual, to the spiritual. And uh, the application of that methodological approach to the past is the study of historical evolution. And uh, here I think he believed, he depended a good deal on his own perception, and here I attach great importance, having studied a bit of his biography, uh, uh, great importance to what he actually saw in all of India during his days as an itinerant monk. Uh, when he went all over India, and that perception stayed with him till the end, I think. If you look at his essays in Vartaman Bharat, Prachya Paschata, etc. And the chief question which uh, are explored by Vivekananda are how spiritual cultivation in religious life developed over the past. How to understand the materialist culture in the West how different religious systems coexist in society. These are the main objects of his attention in his study of historical evolution. I think there was one brilliant aphorism which I must quote to you uh, which sums up his approach to the culture and historical, the issue of culture and, his, and historical evol and spiritual evolution. Uh, he, you know that he gave a seminar at Harvard in 1896 at the invitation of, I think, the Philosophy Society. And uh, there was a question from the floor, what is the Vedantic idea of civilization? And his answer was, Civilization is the manifestation of divinity in man. This, I think, summed up his whole approach 
to the issue of cultural and spiritual evolution of man. Uh, now this being the philosophical position that he took, we now turn to his historical observations. Now in his historical observations, I think three central questions spring to the eye if you look at his writings. One is, in what sense India was spiritual as opposed to the materialistic West? Question number two, did India need to learn from the West or was India self-sufficient? And third, is unity possible in the midst of prevailing religious diversity? And I will focus on these three questions to try to reach at the core of Swamiji's uh, own perception. Number one, materialism or the spiritual path? This was the first question he addressed. Uh, now in this essay I cited earlier, the, the lecture which he later printed as an essay, the lecture in Los Angeles in January 18, 1900, The Historical Evolution of India. He writes, in ancient India, the centers of national life were always the intellectual and spiritual and not political. He goes on to say, political and social power has been always subordinated to spiritual and intellectual power in India. Uh, this is also something that, you know, this essay is something worth reading and uh, um, if the proceedings of this conference are published, I would strongly recommend to Dr. Jason to um, reprint it. In this long essay, Swamiji looked at the historical evolution of this country and first he looks at the Vedic period and then he sums up the entire course of history in about uh, 10 pages. In these 10 pages, I think he makes three important points. Number one, he says that the intellectual, uh, the, the, the cultural and spiritual life of the people cannot be separated from material life. They interpenetrate. For instance, I quote one passage where he says that in India, the majority of the priests, impelled by economic considerations, were bound to, to defend that form of religion which made their existence a necessity of society and assigned them the highest place in the scale of caste. So Brahmins, he says, are uh, motivated by self-interest. On the other hand, the king caste the word king caste obviously is the Kshatriya caste. The Kshatriya caste or king caste whose strong right hand guarded and guided the nation and who now found itself as leading in the higher thoughts also were loath to give up the first place to men who only knew how to conduct a ceremonial, that is to say the priest in the Brahman. There were then others recruited from both the priests and king castes who ridiculed equally the ritualists and philosophers, declared spirit, spiritualism as fraud and priestcraft and upheld the attainment of material comforts at the higher goal, as the highest goal of life. He's talking here of Charvaka and others. And this was the beginning of the triangular fight in India between ceremonials, philosophy, and materialism, which has come down 
unsolved to our own days. Anyway, I cannot go on. This is the lovely passages where he elaborates this idea, but you know, he does, he sees that there is a material foundation to intellectual life, to cultural life. The second point which I think emerges is clearly is that he recognizes that religion has decay. And Hinduism also under, underwent decay. They developed ritualism. They developed a privileged priesthood. There was inequality endorsed by social order Brahmins uh, brought in. Uh, I'll quote one passage where he says, thus we find the struggle renewed the style I talked about earlier between uh, the, um, the Brahmins and the king caste. We find the struggle uh, renewed all along the line in the seventh centuries before the Christian era. And finally in the sixth, overwhelming the ancient order of things under Shakyamuni, the Buddha, in their reaction against the privileged priesthood, Buddhists swept off almost every bit of old ritual of the Vedas. And as you know, he was a great admirer of Gautam Buddha, and there's a great deal about Buddha here. But the chief point he's making here is that when religion decays, then there is a self-renewal of religious spirit, and that's how India has reformed herself time and again. And the third point he, I think, makes here is that religion must reach the masses. And talking of this, he um, he criticizes Shankara, whom in some ways he admired along with Buddha, but he was also a critic of Shankara. And the passage the other day. Uh, the Maharaj and I were discussing this in our Indology department. Bhuganda says here, the movement of Shankara forced its way through its high intellectuality. So it succeeded in that way. But it could be of little service to the masses because of its adherence to strict caste laws, very small scope for the ordinarily, for the ordinary emotion and making Sanskrit the only vehicle of communication. Ramanuja, on the other hand, with a most practical philosophy, a great appeal to the emotions, an entire denial of birthrights before spiritual attainments, and appeals to the popular tongue, completely succeeded in bringing the masses back to the Vedic religion. And then he goes on to talk about uh, Ramananda, Kabir, Dadu, Chaitanya, and Nanak, who again appeal to the masses. But anyway, uh, as I said, you know, I will not stay with just this essay alone, so I must go ahead. Uh, Joy, please remind me when it's time. Uh, so, uh, to proceed with my own exposition, uh, uh, there's uh, no, I have missed out one important yes. Uh, this is a quote. Five to ten minutes. Ten minutes. Okay. Uh, Baganda talks about the. Um, this is in this um, lecture on Vedanta. Uh, there's one passage that I would like to remind you of, where he said, a nation which is great in the possession of material power thinks that this is all to be coveted and that is all that is meant by progress. On the other hand, another nation may think that mere material civilization utterly useless. The aim should be the harmonizing, the mingling of these two ideals. In other words, we are going to believe that India had a great history of spiritual evolution, but the spiritual and the material must not be looked upon as 
contradictory to each other, there must be some harmony brought between the two. And mm, later he says that those who apotheosize or those who make a, make a god of material things are wrong. I omit that there's no time. And particularly memorable is one passage in his address to Manmadura. These were the lectures he gave when he went back, when came back to India from Chicago, from USA, uh, after his great Trumper speech in 1897. And Beganda said that many who claim to be spiritual are degraded representatives of a tradition. We are neither Vedantists, most of us now, nor Puranics, nor Tantrika. We are just don't touchists. Our religion is in the kitchen. Our religion is don't touch me, I'm holy, etc. So to sum it up, I think that Vivekananda made fun of those who make too much of spirituality. And he believed that a, it's a false dichotomy between spirituality and materialism. And hence, his was a search for a middle path. The second thing that I want to talk about today, but which for want of time I won't be able to do very much, is his rejection or acceptance of the West, his decision on that. Um, in an essay he wrote in 1899, in the opening number of the Bengali Journal with Bodhana, he touched on this and he said that to, in the beginning of history there was a mingling of the civilizations of India and Greece. And he said that there is a notion of universal brotherhood among men, which ought to be the ideal of civilization. Uh, in, when he came back to India, his mind was totally preoccupied with this issue of India's modernity, the challenge of the West. And one of his essays was the one he wrote on uh, Prachya and Paschat, Paschato. And uh, I'll very quickly read out this part where he says that India is slowly awakening. And he, <clears throat> uh, to sum it up, he says that there is a conflict between the call of the West and the traditions of the East. And then he asked the question, do we have nothing to learn from the West? And he says, are we perfect? Is our society entirely spotless without any flaw? That man or society which has nothing to learn is already in the jaws of death. Yes, learn we must many things from the West. But there are fears as well, O oh India, the spell of imitating the West is getting into such, getting such a strong hold upon him. So he condemns the blind imitation of the West. At the same time, he also would avoid a total rejection of the West. Uh, and I will omit some pages here and go on to the third question which was about India being divided by religions. Religion that ought to unite men is dividing men in India. Mm -hmm. And there he says that all such, and to begin with, again, you know, he has philosophical position to begin with, which is that he says that the aim of knowledge seeking is to find unities. And of course, he's talking in a scientific way. Science, aims at finding the general among particulars, among many particulars. So he says that knowledge is to find unity in the midst of diversity and goes on to say that in the laws of nature you see this unity. Now building on this epistemology and the faith of his preceptor Ramakrishna Paramahamsa. 
that all religions lead to the same divinity. Vedanta offers a kind of universal religion as the path to unity. Uh, this strain in his thinking begins in 1893 in Chicago uh, because one of his famous speeches was at the end, I think, uh, he says, to the last but one speech perhaps, he says that mankind needs a universal religion which will not be Brahmanic, Christian or Mohammedan but the sum total of these. This was a speech on the 18th of September, 1893. Uh, and finally, one more quote I'll give from him. The religions of the world are not contradictory or antagonistic. They are various phases of one eternal religion. And you often quote it, of course, Paramahansa Jit Dev, Religion is realization, but mere talk, mere parroting the words of ancestors and thinking it is religion, mere making a political something out of the truths of religions is not religion at all. Uh, In conclusion, I would say the chief lesson we learn from my very quick survey uh, within the minutes I had would be that Swami Vivekananda was engaged in resolving conflicts and pointed to a middle path between ideational conflicts, dominant materialist culture versus tradition of spirituality which was peculiar to India. Second, the cultural impact of the West versus the urge to preserve Indian identity. And third, the divisive religious communism versus Sri Ramakrishna's faith in the ultimate unity of all religions. Now, finally, I would say that we are going this this very inadequate uh, and humble attempt to understand Vivekananda, I feel is particularly inadequate because it is happening in a kind of intellectual plane. But his great greatness was to to go beyond it and to write in a way which had an emotional impact on the generation of my father and grandfather. In the, what, when he wrote in Bengali. And particularly when he began to write in Udbodhana. And I would like to end with some of his memorable words on this. Um, already I've anticipated in English the substance of it. But he says here in Bengali what appeals to me and perhaps you. Badjo Jati Shangharse Bharat Krome Binidro Hitechi. A Olpo Jagaru Katar Polosharu Shadin Chintar Kinchit Unmesh Agdike Protokho Shokti Shangrahoru Praman Bahon Shoto Shudja Jyoti Adunik Paschakta Biganev Dusti Protighati Dusti Protighati Prabha Apurdike Swadeshi Bideshi Bohu Monishi Udghatito Jug Jugantare Shahanabuti Joge Shadbo Sharire Tipro Sanchari Balodo Ashaprodo Purbo Purus Diger Apurbo Birjo Omanob Protibha O Debo Durhab Oddhatto Tatto Kahini Agdike Jolo Biggan Prochudhamadhanno, Prohuta Balosanchai, Tibro Indriya Shuk, Bijati O Bhashai, Mohakolahal Uttapito, Koriache, Opol Dike E Mohakolahal Bhed Korea, Keen, Atucha Mando Bhedi Shari, Purbo Deep Digir, Artanad, Kone, Pradesh Koritache. 
একদিকে নব্য ভারত বলিতেছেন পাশ্চাত্য ভাব ভাষা আহার পরিচ্ছদ ও আচার অবলম্বন করিলেই আমরা পাশ্চাত্য জাতিদের ন্যায় বলবীর্য সম্পন্ন হইব অপরদিকে প্রাচীন ভারত বলিতেছেন মূর্খ অনুকরণ দ্বারা পরের ভাব আপনার হয় না অর্জন না করিলে কোন বস্তু নিজের হয় না সিংহ চর্ম আচ্ছাদিত হইলেই কি গর্ধ সিংহ হয় একদিকে নব্য ভারত বলিতেছেন পাশ্চাত্য জাতিরা যাহা করে তাহাই ভালো ভালো না হইলে উহারা এত প্রবল কি প্রকারে হইল অপর দিকে প্রাচীন ভারত বলিতেছেন বিদ্যুতের আলোক অতি প্রবল কিন্তু ক্ষণস্থায়ী বালক তোমার চক্ষু প্রতিহত হইতেছে সাবধান তবে কি আমাদের পাশ্চাত্য জগৎ হইতে কিছুই শিখিবার নাই আমাদের কি চেষ্টা যত্ন করিবার কোনো প্রয়োজন নাই আমরা কি সম্পূর্ণ আমাদের সমাজ কি সর্বতভাবে নিশ্চিত শিখিবার অনেক কিছু আছে যত্ন আমরণ করিতেই হইবে শ্রী রামকৃষ্ণ বলিতেন যতদিন বাঁচি ততদিন শিখি যে ব্যক্তি বা যে সমাজের শিখিবার কিছুই নাই তাহা মৃত্যু মুখে পতিত হইয়াছে এইভাবে যে বিবেকানন্দ চিন্তা করেছিলেন তার তোমার বিবাহ তোমার ধন তোমার জীবন ইন্দ্রিয় সুখের নিজের